All right. Thanks for joining me on The Real Story. The phone number here, 312-642-5600. And as I promised, we have Charles Lipson with us. He is a professor emeritus at the University of Chicago. And uh, Charles, before we begin, I just want to, like, this is one of the reactions. This is just prior to the election. Take a listen. Oops. Peter, I'm having a hard time hearing the clips. Okay. All right. We'll have to get that set, guys. Uh, you know what? I don't need a clip when I have Charles Lipson on. Uh, Charles, thanks so much for joining me on the program. So the media has lost their heads. Uh, you've got the crying and the sobbing. You've got safe spaces at the universities. Um, why did they, did you see this coming? I mean, did you know it was going to be a landslide or what are we, what are they missing here? Well, yes, I saw it coming and I was in an all democratic group two months ago, and they said, who's going to win? And I was the only one of 50 people there who said Trump would win. Uh, In the meeting a month ago, I think six or seven people said so. Uh, In a way, what's really surprising is given how dreadful Kamala Harris was as a candidate, given that 80 percent of the country roughly uh, says we're on the wrong track, it's amazing that she came as close as she did. It it tells you how deeply divided the country is. But I think um, this will be a very different Trump term. I think he knows he's got basically the first two years to accomplish something. And he is intent on doing it. And I think that the key to it is to think about one of those old Venn diagrams that everybody has seen where there are two circles that are overlapping. And you want to get things where the overlap meets, and that is you want to get people who are competent, and you want to get people who are loyal to the Trump agenda. And uh, I think he had some people in the first administration who were competent but not loyal, and some people who were loyal but not competent. And he needs both if he's going to do the big things that I think he wants to do on the southern border, on deportations, and especially on rooting out the deep state. Yeah, no no doubt about it. I was listening to Vivek uh, do a little bit of a podcast with Tucker Carlson, and he says they've got big plans on the deep state specifically, and it really taken apart the civil service uh, entities, uh, you know, and in, in moving parts of D.C. out of uh, D.C. and into the hinterlands. I mean, it's all great, but, I mean, it just it's a monumental task, and I don't want to, you know, throw cold water on it. I think it has to be done. Don't get me wrong, but I think that – I think it's still there's there's a lot of uh, inertia to overcome. Well, I think there's also inertia within the Republican Party, and you oh, can yeah, see it in what true. Mitch McConnell <laughs> is doing now. He's decided to call a very quick secret election for who will uh, succeed him as the leader. Uh, and today, this evening, we heard that Elon Musk had endorsed Rick Scott. And I think that's very important because I don't think uh, Musk would have done that without talking with Trump. And I think that that's, in a way, a Trump endorsement of the per, uh, of the three people running, Cornyn, Thune, and Rick Scott, a uh, senator from Florida. I think he thinks that Scott is the one that is absolutely the closest to his agenda. And uh, so I think that that's going to be very important. But I think that the Democrats have big problems ahead and they have to sort those problems out. Well, I think they're I think that that's going to take forever with them. I, I, I just don't see them leaving their progressive wing behind at all. And they don't have much of a bench. But I mean, when you look about this and people are calling this a landslide and certainly it was it was definitely historic. So he's got 312 electoral votes. I mean, it, honestly, in 2012, Obama had 332 in 2008, 365. Um, Bush didn't do very well, but I mean, even Clinton had 379 and 370. So from that standpoint, it doesn't feel like a landslide. Why does it feel like a landslide? Why does it feel like it was such a revolutionary moment in our in our country to vote Trump back in? Because he promised big changes to Washington. I think that uh, I think Obama was a very consequential president because he put in for two reasons. The first was that Obama put in place the last major missing stone in the edifice that uh, the Democrats have been trying to construct since FDR, and that was health care. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's also consequential because I think he was the power behind the throne in the Biden 
Biden presidency uh, with a lot of his own people still left in the White House, and I think he would have been, again, in Kamala Harris's. Uh, so this is a real change, and I think Trump is not uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. He's not Richard Nixon. He's not Gerald Ford. He's somebody who's promising to turn things in a very different direction, and I think uh, – if he can deliver on economic growth and lower inflation, then I think most Americans will consider him a big success. But if he can't deliver on some of his promises about rolling back the administrative state, I think it will end up being like Ronald Reagan's presidency in the sense that it accomplished very big things. But as soon as Reagan uh, and it, uh, left office, even with George H.W. Bush in there, Really, the state continued to grow, centralized government continued to grow, Americans continued to be governed by regulations, not by laws passed by elected representatives. I think that's what's got to change. So it, that that is interesting because I think that, though, I think the people coming in to the new Trump administration, I think they understand that. And I, I think they know that they want to make lasting change for the people. But I think there's something else that was really important here. And it's and it's, it's it was I mean, granted economy was the top issue, apparently, yep. followed by immigration. Abortion was down like number third at 11 percent in a Wall Street Journal um, editorial that came out with, about all this stuff. But I think this was a rebuke of the elitists more than anything. I think this was more of a cultural revolution to some degree. And a rebuke of them. I mean, this is this is, uh, you know, uh, David Samuel writing in Unheard uh, basically says this is a dismantling of the Obama legacy with the Trump election. Uh, I was just reading it ahead of you you coming on. And um, and and he speaks specifically about the, you know, nobody likes these elitists anymore and they are they're on to him. Well, um, I I think that there's a lot to that. Uh, I would just say that uh, people mean different things by elitists. But what they basically mean is that people who look down on them. <laughs> Actually, I'm reminded, <laughs> I'm reminded of a joke by one of the best people of all, which is um, Bob Newhart. And he said, uh, I, <clears throat> uh, I don't mean to be condescending to people who like country music, he said, and for people who do like country music, condescending means look down on them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Americans get it. When people yeah. look down on you, they get it. And I think that that's why uh, he picked um, J.D. Vance, maybe, instead of, say, Glenn Young can and so forth, that he wants to solidify this MAGA movement and he wants to do it with somebody who is not perceived as a member of the East Coast elite. By the way, on that point, I think that the big fight within the Democratic Party will be between the two coasts versus the uh, the Josh Shapiro's, Andy Bashir from Kentucky, Elise Stefanik from Michigan, maybe Tammy Baldwin, for the people from the Midwest, purple states, and they don't they know that those are not winning strategies. If they keep with the Oprah Winfrey strategy, mm -hmm. they won't win. Well, they've got a lot of ground to cover. So um, looking a little bit more locally, you've got uh, Governor Pritzker out there saying that he's going to be a happy warrior and defend people. I mean, what are, what are they predicting? I mean, martial law or something? I mean, this guy was the biggest COVID shutdown or possible. I mean, and, and a hypocrite during it and, and a big spender and everything. And, and they're just predicting. I, I feel like they should, you know, get a bingo card right now, start filling it out and see if if all of their predictions about uh, his tyrannical government comes true under Trump? Well, people are voting with their U-Hauls, aren't they? <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, I mean, they're, uh, California, I think, is the first time in recorded history that they've lost population. And uh, I think people there are, uh, people are just furious about the open southern border. Yes. And that got uh, uh, linked to problems with crime because people were furious about that. Uh, your listeners know that Chicago didn't vote in uh, another of these Soros prosecutors. And in L.A., 
George Gaston was voted out. So there's a movement that that's turning against us. People want basic safety. I mean, it's they want the the borders control. They want basic safety. They don't want millions of people let in, and we don't know who they are. They, so, uh, we know that some are from organized drug cartels. We know that some are terrorists, and um, we just uh, we're endangered by it, and we want protection. So to the extent that, uh, you know, people like Pritzker or Hochul try to disrupt or interfere with Trump's agenda in terms of national issues, uh, I think that they could get their comeuppance in a couple of years when they're up for election as well. I mean, Trump did gain. He did. He did gain. You know, he Biden beat him in Illinois by 17 points. And this time Harris only beat him by eight to nine points. So that's a gain. But. It doesn't, you know, honestly, we have a lot more work to do here to change people's hearts and minds. But if Pritzker is going to go down this road and Hochul as well, I think that uh, I think we've got an opportunity here to message about exactly whose side they're on. I agree. But I I think that California, which some Republicans talk about flipping, that's Lucy and the football. Oh, yes, absolutely. I would agree with that, too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, you know, what are you looking forward to? Oh, and by, by the way, what's your what's your response to some of these crybabies on college campuses at, at this point? I mean, literally, uh, you had this you had this issue at the, even Eastern Illinois University. You know, they they said we've got counseling available. They literally wrote out a memo by their belonging and access uh, chief diversity well, officer. I think that I think DEI programs oh, yeah. will be uh, uh, abolished all over the mm-hmm. country maybe least of all in the bluest of blue states. But uh, I think one of the, uh, the the Department of Education will move dramatically to change some of these things, including the way that Title IX is interpreted to allow um, transgender females, that is, biological males to play against uh, women. I think on all those issues, Republicans have huge majorities and will uh, in the popular sentiment and will move uh, quickly on that. So uh, but I I do think that what's happened with colleges is that uh, almost none of the elite colleges uh, have moved in a way to punish the students who disrupted class, violated all the rules, and the rest of it. And one of the things that we're seeing is that uh, parents uh, want to send their uh, their kids to schools uh, that are that are just have a more solid basis. So there's a big in, uh, surge in enrollment in the South. And the leader, by the way, is Vanderbilt, uh, headed by Dan Dermeyer, who used to be number two at the University of Chicago. So this is a University wow. of Chicago free speech. Wow. Let's enforce things. So this is this is good news, and it's happened all over. You're actually you're seeing the return of SAT scores. Those yep. used to be voluntary. But uh, no more, because what was happening was you were getting students uh, turned down who had very good scores and students accepted who didn't in order to create in order to fill out yep. check boxes. Hey, we've got to run. I got to thank you so much for coming on The Real Story with me tonight. Thanks a lot, Charles.